obviously before starting plenty of forward looking statements. But there was a lot of I, I enjoyed the conversation when we talk about all these different metals that are required for batteries and we see this supply demand uh, gap. But if we look at the fundamentals um, in all the cases, except for copper and and perhaps nickel, right? When we talk about 20 times more lithium, but we're only producing 100,000 tons a year, the deposits are not a problem. Okay. In the case of rare earths, the deposits are not the problem. In the case of cobalt, deposits are not the problem. It's how long does it take to get those projects into production because it takes five, three to five years to develop an electric vehicle or a battery plant, but it can take 20 years to get a project up and running. So that is the big supply demand gap in the majority of the metals. But the kind of elephants in the room are copper and nickel because we've been mining copper since the Bronze Age. Uh, and we haven't been exploring it, and now we need two to three times more. And the deposits do not exist. And so that's a significant difference between copper and nickel and the other metals. Because if we look, and depends who you talk to, we've seen this graph a million times, huge demand coming up, and then there's also the supply side. And in the case of copper, on average, it takes 17 years to get a project into production post-discovery, and we have seven years to fill 8.2 million tons in this case, but you hear numbers of 10 million, you hear numbers of 5 million. And what does that really mean? 5 million tons per year in copper is the equivalent of the 10 largest copper mines in the world. I'm a mining engineer with 25 years in the industry, and we know this is not going to happen. We know that this is impossible to do. There is not enough projects out there to be built. Then we look at the backdrop of what's really happening in the world. And we, I heard some very interesting discussions and, and, it, and it's nice to hear those discussions happening because I don't think we understand what's really going on a geopolitical stage. A lot of stuff is going on in the background because while the majority of copper is coming out of Chile and Peru, for example, the majority of it is going to China. And China has controlled their production, their supply chains to dominate in this energy transition. So the rest of the world now is, is scrambling, trying to secure those supply chains. And it's interesting that we focus first on batteries, lithium, et cetera, because it's the wolf closest to the fire. But I think that we're gonna see this over and over again in the additional metals as supply starts coming online that, oh, the next problem is nickel. The next problem is copper. And then by the time we get to that problem, I think it's going to be a little bit too late. Then the other side of the room is, I hear it all the time, I go to green energy conferences, and as a representative of the mining industry, I always get asked, what is the industry doing to fill this supply demand gap? And the truth is, the industry is doing nothing to fill that gap. And nor is it our responsibility. For some reason, it feels that it's our responsibility to do this, but it is not. And we can see from the biggest companies in the world, not in, in record M&A, not a single one was into a project every single one was into a producing mine. So I like to think of it as a pie. And that's the amount of copper or nickel or whatever materials, in this case, copper. And everybody's scrambling, freaking out. And the last thing that they're doing is building more mines. They are scrambling to grab their slice of the pie. They're securing their supply. And then the other thing that happened while we're sleeping that we haven't seen in all the other cycles, right? is the larger companies in the world that are worried that one day they're going to need an electric motor from China. And China is not going to have, there's not going to be enough copper in the world and they're going to go, nope, not going to send you a motor. Because if I sell you a motor, that's one less car I can sell. So we've seen the scrambling of all the large O&Ms, the big car manufacturers, commit to $500 billion in investment. And, it, and what's also very interesting in every single one of them, there's we're going to invest $10 billion, but a billion of that dollars is to secure our supply chain. So we're seeing a lot of offtake agreements. Everybody's scrambling to get their little cut of the pie, but there's not enough pie. So maybe Volkswagen will be okay, but somebody else will not be okay. And so this scenario is playing out uh, in front of us. And so with that backdrop, one of the things that I'll share with you about Libero, which I think is a major difference between our company and many others, is that we have a team that's built mines. We've gotten mines all the way through to become future mines. So if you guys are individual investors, think of your portfolio and think of all the times that one of those projects actually went on to become a future mine. 
So in the case of Libero, we have assets in Canada, Colombia, and Argentina. And our flagship asset is the Macoa project in Colombia. And if you look at the two largest industrial scale mines to Macoa in Colombia, the first is uh, Cobre Panama, where Ernie Mass, one of our directors, was CEO of Inmets Cobre Panama and took that project all the way through permitting. It was purchased uh, by First Quantum and went on to be built to be the first large scale mine in the history of Panama. I myself uh, was senior vice president and country manager for Corriente Resources and took the Corriente Mirador project all the way through to the start of construction post sale and it went on to become the first large-scale mining operation in the history of Ecuador. And those are the two projects closer, closest to Macoa in Colombia. And more examples within our team of projects, people that have worked on projects and know how to get them across the finish line. So our way of doing things might be different than the majority of the companies that you see. We focus on different things. We focus on a formula where we work heavily on our local, national reputation, and deriving political will because that is what gets projects across the finish line. So others might be focusing on other issues. We have always been focused on how to get our projects all the way through and across the finish line. And the other part, our biggest shareholder is Anglo-Asian Mining, which built the mines and is the biggest miner in Azerbaijan. And so they're a great partner because they also have a full team of operating experts on how to build mines, design mines, and operate mines. So if we look specifically at our flagship asset, uh, Makoa, right, and say, why Colombia? Okay. Well, the first answer is because the world needs more copper. Where is it going to find more copper? Right. And there is a belt, the Andean belt, right, uh, that goes between Chile and through Argentina, all the way through Panama. And on that belt are 12 of the 20 largest producing mines in the world. So where you're going to find more is going to be on that belt. Just in Chile and Peru alone right now are about 45% of the world's copper production in minerals, not in copper, right? And now you actually see Chile's production is actually reducing. You saw many years ago, Peru was probably fifth and then it was fourth and now it's the second largest producer. We now see Ecuador is now producing with the Mirador mine and it has six projects in currently in development. The good news is, is that geology does not respect boundaries, uh, geopolitical boundaries, and that in this case, the Jurassic Belt continues right into Colombia, where the Macoa project demonstrates the potential of Colombia. Today, it has 2 million tons of copper, and it's open in all directions, but it's one, already a very significant uh, project. So in, as a backdrop, you say, can Colombia become the next large copper producer? Okay. And it has so many things going for it. First, as we see this geopolitical scramble, the United States is looking to secure the supply chains, bring manufacturing home, it's said, is the, the key word, but it's really, we, call, we hear uh, decoupling from China, we hear de-risking from China, but the truth is, is there's some fear out there that the companies do not control their supply chains, and due to this supply-demand gap, it's a big issue. The other part of Colombia, so there's great relationship. It's a major non-NATO ally of the United States, which puts it on the same level of Australia, Japan, et cetera, has a free trade agreement, et cetera. And it's been focused within its national development plan, which was actually approved last week, finally, uh, by Congress, how to make the shift from oil and coal into sustainable energy based off of the minerals. Because today, oil and coal are 60% of the exports of Colombia. There's a huge dependence on oil and coal. And they know either the world won't need it in the future or because of the policy. And the policy today is we need to decarbonize. Colombia wants to be a leader in the energy transition. It's the desire of the president. And we see as this discourse in the very beginning, Petro has been president in, since August. It was about energy transition and the importance of the energy transition. And then you hear more about industrialization. And now we see the discourse changing. He's prepared the room. He's prepared the country. And now it is. We must take our potential technology, our air, our wind, and the minerals we have and put them all together to become a leader uh, in the energy transition in the world. But there's some key components of that strategy. It's the energy transition, it's the minerals, but it's also industrialization. 
We have to understand that having the materials and exporting them is not the smartest thing to do. They want to put that material into production chains. And so that's what we have been focusing on as a company. There's four major projects. There's one operator and there's three big projects in, 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 in Colombia. But the McCall project is also one of the few projects that doesn't have an existing offtake agreement. So we have been working with the government. I'll skip that, working together with the government at the request of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry to say, how do you take that copper and develop production chains out of it? So we put together and we worked and it's called the Green, uh, uh, the Green, uh, Green Root Alliance, La Ruta Verde, Alianza de Ruta Verde, yeah, Green Root Alliance, where we're working together with recyclers, emerging companies to start building production chains based off of recycled copper. The idea is to start building those production chains so that in the future, when the Bacoa project goes into production, it is filling an existing production chain. That's the, the basis of it in simplicity. And so that's why our most recent news release has been focused on the designing of a project. Focusing on getting a project into production as quickly as possible is the best way we can de-risk the project. The Bacoa project, which has 2 million tons of copper uh, per pound in the ground, that's about a half a penny per pound in the ground. So we see the easiest way to create value for our shareholders is to demonstrate a clear pathway forward into how to take this project into production. And we're working with Anglo Asian, which is wonderful because they are doing the design work, the engineering, all the things that are necessary without paying uh, uh, outsiders fees to be able to get this work done. And they're doing it with innovation, which is also nice. You don't see a lot of innovation when you go to your to your consultants out there to how to get a project into production. They have a cookie cutter way of approaching projects. So we're looking at how can we get this project into production as quickly as possible is the best way to de-risk uh, so that when this project goes into production, it is entering into a supply chain and it's creating that industrialization, which is what Columbia wants to do. Again, so if you look at the details of the project, it already has over 600 million tons of uh, inferred resource, has over 2 million tons of copper, and it is also one of the world's largest undeveloped Mali projects. It contains 232,000 tons of Mali. In comparison, world production is 279,000 tons. So it gives you it a perspective. It could convert Colombia into the fifth largest producer of Mali in the world. It could probably produce 5% of the world's demand. Uh, and we also, uh, our current resource is based on $10. And today, last time I checked, Mali was $22. So we're seeing if we repriced our resource, we'd probably see about a 20% increase in grade just on the Mali alone. So uh, in from a capital structure part, I also think that this is uh, an absolute wonderful time. We've uh, obviously suffered for a change of politics uh, within Colombia, and I think a poor perception of what's actually happening in Colombia. Um, and we were previously had a great price, but I think we're going to be rebuilding as the off of that low price because the world is going to start understanding what we're doing and that this project is advancing hand in hand with the with the Colombian government. So in summary, I think that we're in the right commodities. We have the experience as a team of how to get projects into production. We have a strong partner with Anglo Asian. We have incredible geology. I wish I had more time to just talk about it. But we also have a clear strategy. Our strategy is how to get our projects uh, into production and how to develop. We have a secret recipe of how to develop and work on true relationships on the ground to build that political will within the countries we work. Thank you.